When I was in high school, my friends and I were all in a reading club together. A few years after we graduated, the four of us were invited back to chaperone the students during the club's annual camping trip. We joined my advisor, her infant son, her husband, and a few of his friends, who served as our security guards, and a dozen high school students for a three-day weekend trip. The year I chaperoned was the first time the trip was held at Camp Timberline because the place we usually went, Camp Mokolea, was booked. Those of you who know Oahu know that Camp Mokolea has more than its fair share of spooky stories. Unlike the usual campsite, we all stayed in one huge two-story cabin instead of two smaller cabins. The main floor of the cabin held the main living area and kitchen, and the upstairs had many bedrooms. We arrived for a three-day weekend and had a blast the first two days, Friday and Saturday. We were due to go home on Sunday, so it was tradition that the night before was ghost story night. Everyone gathered in the main room to listen to and tell their favorite stories. This being Hawaii, almost everyone had an eerie experience to share. Around midnight, our advisor sent everyone to bed. It had been my group of friends' tradition to pull an all-nighter to play cards and bullshit the night before we had to go home from an event. We were in a lot of clubs together. So that's what we did. Slowly, the noise in the house died down, and eventually, we were the only ones awake. Several times while we played cards, one person or another would notice movement outside the room in the hallway, but we figured it was because we had been spooked by the stories. By 3 a.m., we were all exhausted, so we said our good nights and went to bed. The next morning, I walked downstairs to get breakfast. The students were still upstairs packing. My best friend Travis was in the kitchen speaking urgently to our advisor. The two of them share a special connection because they both are, at the risk of sounding corny, a little psychic. They both looked tired and pale. I asked what was wrong. This is what they told me, and recounting it still gives me chills. That night, as soon as he had gone to bed, Travis dreamt of an old woman. He couldn't describe her features, but he sensed that she was malevolent. He kept saying that she felt very, very evil. In his dream, the witch was crouched in the upstairs hallway of the cabin, outside of our advisor's room. He saw that she was leaning over and saying something, but he could not make out the words. In his dream, he went closer and saw that she was calling to the baby, my advisor's son. The baby and his parents were sleeping on sleeping bags on the floor. He desperately tried to stop her, but he was powerless, which alarmed him because he is a lucid dreamer. When he woke up that morning, he immediately found our advisor and told her about his dream. She was silent for a while after he finished. Then she told him about her night. Her son usually slept through the night, but that night, her son kept waking up in the middle of the night to crawl toward the door. The incident was relayed to the other adults. One of the older chaperones, who was of native Hawaiian descent, advised that everyone should be salted before we left the campgrounds that day. In Hawaiian tradition, salt is used to cleanse people places of evil spirits. Everyone was salted before getting into their vehicles and were instructed to salt again before entering their homes. As far as I know, the club never went back to those campgrounds. My mom is a pretty chill person. She's a little religious nowadays, but a lot of that has to do with her past, which, mind you, is pretty crazy. She grew up in the 70s and lived a fairly normal life. Over the years as I've gotten older, I've begun to know her more like a friend and less like a mom. Recently, she confided in me why she hates Halloween. Growing up, my mom let me and my brother celebrate the holiday, but she never got into the spirit of Halloween. No decorations, no parties. She just let us go trick-or-treating with our dad and that was it. She never passed out candy. All of this had to do with something tragic from her past, something that happened on one Halloween night. You've probably heard about the candy scars from back in the day. The rumor was that someone put razor blades in candy and a couple kids got jacked up. Since then, they've debunked the stories, stating rather conclusively that they were urban legends with no factual truth. According to my mom though, some of these stories were real. And because of that, she can't celebrate Halloween. My mom grew up in a suburb outside of Milwaukee. Like every other little kid in the world, she was excited to celebrate Halloween. She was nine years old when it happened. 
Everything was normal, she said, like every other Halloween. Her father would take her and her sister and brother trick or treating right at seven. They would walk around collecting candy for an hour or so and then head back home. They got to eat a few pieces of candy and then watch a show together before heading to bed. On that particular Halloween, my mom said she was dressed as Minnie Mouse. Her younger brother was Mickey and her older sister was Daisy Duck. They were a trifecta of Disney characters. They walked around their neighborhood, just like in previous years, and started filling their buckets with candy from their neighbors. Then they got to one house on the end of their street, a house they normally avoided. My mom didn't really specify why they avoided it. They just did. They approached the house apprehensively, taking a few small steps at a time, trying to guard how close they got. The man that opened the door, according to my mom, was massive. He was bald and his stare was empty. He reached into their bags and placed candy, but they couldn't tell what he'd put inside, if anything. There was a group of kids walking with them who started eating candy right away. My mom looked over and saw a kid smile and then his face turned stone cold. Blood poured out of his mouth. He started coughing and convulsing on the sidewalk. My mom, as a little kid, reached down to help him, but he just spit blood on her. As she was telling me about it, she said he just kept spitting blood more and more until her mini costume was covered in it. The kid tried to talk, but it was to no avail. He opened his mouth and his tongue fell out. Right there on the sidewalk, his tongue fell out of his mouth. Still to this day, mom turns white as she tells the story, the blood leaving her face. There was so much blood, she said, and the way his tongue fell out of his mouth, it was like he was just spitting out broccoli he didn't want to eat. My mom said everyone around them started screaming. They were looking for an adult, someone to intervene in the situation. But it was just the few of them standing there. Then another kid started coughing a little further down the street. It was the same thing as before. Blood filled the front of his shirt until he passed out on the ground. My mom was about to run towards him when another kid right next to her started going through the same thing. Blood leaked out of his mouth and ran down his street. The way my mom tells it, he looked at her in the eyes, crying and begging for her to do something. Then his mouth burst open as blood spilled out. He spit out stuff from the inside, not his tongue, but his tonsils. They plopped on the ground and then he passed out. I find this all hard to believe, but according to my mom, what happened next was the most terrifying thing to ever occur. Four or five more kids started going through the same thing. Blood spewed all around her. She looked to my uncle. His smile cracked open and blood came trickling out, filling his Mickey Mouse costume. She screamed and wrapped her arms around him. The blood soaked her shirt as well. He opened his mouth and then his head snapped backwards. The full weight of his body was too much for my mom, so she let him drop to the ground. At that moment, she says, she looked back at the creepy house and the man was standing there on his porch. He was staring out at the carnage. He was smoking a long pipe and laughing maniacally. The end is coming, children, he said. The end is coming. Although my mom thought the scene was undetected by police or adults, she was wrong. Shots rang out in the night, and the man on the porch fell to his knees. In seconds, he was surrounded by police who cuffed him and kicked down his door. My mom stood there on the sidewalk watching it all happen. They recovered a lot of interesting items from his house. They found a basement with various torture devices. They found hundreds of Polaroid pictures all over his house of kids and teenagers and they found a bowl full of chopped up razor blades. Turns out the man in the house was chopping up razor blades and putting them into candy. Some of the pieces were large, others were fairly small. The end result, however, was the same. They cut up the inside of his victim's mouths. My mom said she threw away all the candy she collected that night. Her brother, my uncle, survived the massacre. To this day, he has a bit of a speech impediment when he talks. He says it's just how his tongue works. My mom tells me he has blocked out the memory of that Halloween night, and rightfully so. After all my mom went through on that Halloween night, I'm surprised she let any of us participate in the holiday. I asked her why she is okay with us going out and experimenting with the candy. As a young kid, I remember my mom meticulously checking the candy before we got to dig in. She'd open most of the pieces just to be safe and find that they were without razor blades or tampering of any kind. I appreciated it and all. She confided in me. I don't sleep at all on Halloween. 
I'm up half the night thinking about that man on his front porch and the kids who spit out their tongues. I don't think I'll ever unsee that. We survived Halloween this year as we normally do. But when my mom told me that story, I couldn't help but think a little differently about the holiday. I understand why she stays inside and doesn't dress up. I understand now why she hates Halloween. I was swimming in the lake like I usually did in late summer. The water's not totally clear, but it's not brown or anything. Has some fish and stuff in it, and the lake is not too big. Perfect for relaxation. Another big detail, and maybe a factor into what happened, is that this lake is in a way into a patch of woods. Some rivers feed into it too. It was me and another swimmer, a teenage girl, a little bit away from where I was swimming. She looked to be my age, so I thought, hey, why not go introduce yourself? Get a swimming buddy. Okay, she was pretty cute too. I swam over and introduced myself and we started up a conversation while treading water. I don't want to say her name though. If anyone from where I live reads this, they will know what I'm talking about. I don't want to be a suspect or be called crazy either. I'm already taking a big risk posting this anyways. Now back to the girl and I. We talked for a bit. She actually goes to the same high school I go to. We swam around and some other stuff. It was starting to get late. We had both been swimming around for several hours and we were taking a break. I said I had to go soon and recommended that we play a quick game of water tag. She said it wouldn't be fun with just two people, but I pushed her. Why did I push her? Why didn't I just go home or offer to walk her home or something? Sorry, small panic attack. I hate thinking about this. It makes me feel like I'm there, watching this happening all over again. I told her to chase me since she didn't want to play at first, and I jumped back into the water. We were laughing, splashing water into each other's face, trying to slow the other down. She was gaining on me, so I decided to try to dive and swim under her. The lake was deep enough for that. I closed my eyes and did my best underwater to try and swim behind her. When I emerged, she was already turning around laughing. She said it wasn't fair to try and drag her underwater. This is when things started to get weird. I didn't try to grab her underwater. I had closed my eyes and just tried to get behind her. I started to tell her that I didn't do anything, but she just laughed and lunged forward, tapping me on the head. She said I was it and started to swim backwards, away from me. But I was still trying to process what she told me. A thought popped into my mind and I confronted her, saying she made up about me grabbing her to be a distraction into tagging me. I said that wasn't fair, but she stopped swimming and looked at me strangely. She insisted that I did, and that I almost pulled her whole head under. That's when I started to get really worried. My constant reading of scary stories started to get my imagination running. I started arguing with her, but she kept blaming me on trying to pull her under. She was so serious if I had only believed her sooner. After a few minutes, I started to get a bit scared, and that's when the scary water story popped back into my mind. I said we should get out of the water, but the girl just cracked a smile and said I was copping out of the game because I was losing. After another minute of trying to get my point across, I think she started to believe me. All the time I was glancing around the water, my imagination started playing tricks on me. Every ripple seemed to be heading our way. I started to swim to shore and the girl followed. Then everything went downhill. I heard a small grunt and the girl started to scream behind me. I stopped and turned around. She was still swimming, but had a panicked expression on her face. Something just grabbed me. That sentence alone got my adrenaline pumping, and I started swimming even faster. We were about 40, 50 yards from shore when she screamed again. I turned back again to see the girl being pulled backwards deeper into the lake. Her hand was outstretched. She was screaming for help, but I was filled with fear. I turned my back on her and kept swimming. I thought I would feel a tug at any second and be pulled to a watery grave. Somehow I made it to shore, and after gasping for breath for a few seconds, I turned to look at the lake. There were ripples and bubbles further towards the center of the lake, where she was dragged. I thought before suddenly throwing up on the ground. The realization hit me, I just heard, maybe watched someone die, and I let it happen. The scary stories I had read mixed with the feelings of horror and sickness in my mind. I had to leave. I had to run, say something to anyone. But who would listen? 
Who would believe such an awful and unbelievable story? My mind began to panic more and more, before finally deciding to just run. I grabbed everything and brought with me, before glancing back to the lake, vainly hoping that this was all some sick joke. What I saw, though, confirmed that this was all too real. Near the shallows were two pairs of glowing orbs, which had to be eyes. They were staring at me. They had to be staring at me. How could they be in such shallow water? Something had to be bigger to drag a teenage girl. I continued staring at them before the orb-like eyes turned and went back to the center of the lake. I turned and ran home as fast as I could, hoping those things couldn't fly or go on land. Later that night, I saw her on the news, being reported missing, her clothes and other belongings found at the lake by her parents. I stared at the emergency phone number on the screen as the reporter asked anyone for any information. I wanted to call. I wanted to call her parents too and tell them what I saw. But how? How could I help without seeming to be crazy or the one who did it? Now I'm living in constant fear. Did someone happen to see me with her at the lake? And those things in the water? I've had nightmares since. I'm scared of going to bed each night. And what about other swimmers? How can I warn anyone else about not swimming in the lake? What should I do? What should I do? All right, guys, that will be the end of this video. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the realm of the unknown. We hope you enjoyed today's creepy stories. We commend your bravery if you've made it to the end of the video. Remember, the darkness is always there, waiting. Before we part ways, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell to stay up to date with our daily updates. We upload one or more videos every day. If you have any creepy stories you wish to share, then feel free to share them in the comments below, or you could email the stories to us. It might be one of the featured stories for a future video. Until next time, my friends, remember to keep your lights on and your doors locked, and always be aware of your surroundings. The world is a mysterious place. We never know what might lurk in the shadows.